You may be seated. <laughs> yeah, Changing the Climate is uh, our series title for February and I've enjoyed sharing God's Word with you. We started by talking about to change the climate of our hearts, heart transformation and uh, a life that runs after Jesus. When your life is geared to be running after him, your heart will be changed. Then last week we talked about building bigger people, recognising what Jesus is doing in us, and we shared about the changes to our leadership in the church, our reorganisation and development of, of new leaders, and our aim and heart is to recognize what Jesus is doing and to empower our leaders to help build you into bigger people. Today I want to share on growing as generous stewards, Jesus' heart for his house. Stewardship may be a new word for some of you. For those of us who've been around for a long time, it's, uh, we understand it pretty well. But um, for some of you, it might be a new concept. So when the Bible says that we are stewards in this world that God has made, what does it really mean? Well, it has to do with acknowledging God's ownership over everything. Christian stewardship, properly defined, is the wise administration of God's creation and grace and gifts by His people. Folks, to change the climate of our church, we need to really grasp the concept of God's ownership. And then we will see the importance of our stewardship response to when we fully grasp that God is the owner of all things. Look at these scriptures, that God is the ultimate possessor of everything in heaven and on earth. Psalm 24, 1 says, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Psalm 50.10, for every animal of the forest is mine and the cattle on a thousand hills. In Haggai, he says, the silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. Ezekiel says, for every living soul belongs to me, the Father as well as the Son, both alike belong to me. And Paul says in 1 Timothy 5.17, put your hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. He says, everything that comes our way is from God. He provides for us. So all things belong to him, and he is the ultimate landlord, even though this may be alien to our world's thinking. Now, within our world, there are two great political and economic ideologies, and they've been around for about 150 years. And uh, these two ideologies are socialism and capitalism. Who knows who created socialism and capitalism? Names stick out like the Webbs and Karl Marx, communism or the extreme form of socialism, Adam Smith and uh, for capitalism. So these concepts actually, they started writing about them in the 17th and 18th century. And uh, so these two great ideologies are still around. Did you realise that they are built on faulty premises and their foundations are built upon a lie? What's the lie? Well, socialism believes that the state owns all things. And in the extreme form, it says that the state should own all the means of production. That's a communistic society. So there is no liberty and freedom for personal ownership. Capitalism says that individuals must, they must be the owners and the state should own as little as possible. So right now in the United States, there is a presidential election going on. You've, you've heard about it. It's probably in the news every day. And um, there are two characters that are, are two grumpy old men who somehow have captured the imagination of the American people, but they're really of the extreme left and of the extreme right. One's name is Bernie, the other's name is Donald. 
Bernie's so far left in his socialism that it's kind of like never happened before. And, uh, and Donald is so far right that uh, they're both extremists, but they've actually taken those ideologies and the way they're propounding them, it's almost like that's their God that they worship. And I certainly hope the Christian foundations of the US come to the fore in, in, in some of their, their thinking and maybe others who will take the nominations. They're struggling to try and find, to get the nomination of their political parties. That's not the election. We've got till November to put up with this. I can't handle Donald anymore. What about you? <laughs> the Bible teaches that the world's wealth actually belongs to God, not to man. So both socialism and capitalism are built on a false ideology. Therefore, whatever we give back to him as Christ followers, as Christians, and we practice tithing and giving and supporting, and we did that this morning, whatever we give back to him, it remains true that we are returning to God only what is already his. We can claim no ownership of anything on this earth. You came into this world with nothing and you will leave with nothing. Everything else is on loan. And he is the author and the creator of all things that are good. So now let me focus on our stewardship response to the truth, the biblical truth, and I've given you just a few verses, that God is the owner of all things. What should our response be? Well, there's some great examples in the Bible. I love King David. I mean, he's not a good example when it comes to following his... his uh, marriage and family life. So you don't learn from him about how to, to kind of conduct marital relations or how to raise kids. In fact, the guys up here today are much better examples than King David was. It's true. However, he was an awesome example in other areas and one of them was as a faithful steward. Man, was he generous, really generous. And when you read the book of Chronicles, in the Old Testament, 1 and 2 Chronicles, 1 and 2 Kings, and uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 27, and I'm just going to refer to it, tells a story about David's preparations for the building of the temple of God. And he kind of figured that if he, was, if he as king had a beautiful palace that he could enjoy, why shouldn't God have an awesome temple rather than living in a tent, the tent of meeting, which was the, the, the meeting place where people would meet with God through that avenue of worship, which of course no longer exists today. We have the reality of Christ who's appeared and he's introduced us to the Father. But back then, it was a religious system and, and kind of the worship of God centered around the tent of meeting. And he said, well, if God's living in that space, why can't we get him a beautiful, a beautiful house? So David is such an inspirational model about being a generous steward because he had a heart for God's house. He wanted to bless God, he wanted the best for God. And he inspires us that we should have a heart for Jesus' house, his church, the vehicle by which he expresses himself to bring blessing into our world. Let me read to you a little bit of uh, uh, 1 Chronicles 29. It says this, this is David speaking. In verses 3 onwards, he goes, besides in my devotion to the temple of my God, I now give my personal treasure. So he not only gave monies that were collected through taxation for, for the building of the temple, he says, now I'm going to give you my money, my personal treasures of gold and silver for, for the temple of my God, over and above everything I've provided for this holy temple. He goes, 3,000 talents of gold and 7,000 talents of refined silver. Now, 3,000 talents of gold, I've discovered from the commentators, say that one talent weighs around 75 pounds, and if the price of gold today, I, I checked it out on Google, and Google never lies, it's about $1,200 an ounce, apparently, but let's say it's dropped down to $1,000 an ounce. Do you know how much David gave of his own resources? $4 billion. He emptied his bank account and said, I'm going to give God my best. And David's motivation in testifying 
to the amount of this gift was not in a spirit of boastfulness. He wasn't bragging. It wasn't pride. He wasn't calling attention to himself or self and sort of self-promotion. David's motivation was for God's glory and as an example and an inspiration to the leaders and the people and, and uh, for the people of Israel to follow. And I think that that is a wonderful example. My wife and I, Kath and I, um, have tried to follow David's example uh, ever since we've been here. Um, and uh, we have never asked people to give generously and sacrificially if we ourselves haven't. And uh, it's been my joy and privilege to facilitate the raising of millions of dollars in tithes and offerings and missions giving and facilities and that. But each time, I cannot ask people to give if, if I myself am not giving. And also, if I'm asking for people to give sacrificially, that we give sacrificially. And, uh, and I've tried to be an open book and say, this is how much I give, this is how much I earn, got nothing to hide, and if I can give more, I will do that. And David's a great example of this. The leaders and the people followed his example. And this type of sacrificial giving was done willingly and joyfully. It says this in 1 Chronicles 29. David says, now, who is willing to consecrate themselves to the Lord today after he gave his gift? Then the leaders of families, the officers of the tribes of Israel, the commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds and the officials in charge of the king's work gave willingly. The people rejoiced at the willing response of their leaders, for they had given freely and wholeheartedly to the Lord. And David the king also rejoiced. He is a fantastic example of somebody who had a heart for God's house, and we can learn from him. I've certainly learnt that lesson from King David. The Scriptures, God's holy book, inspires us, encourages us, and instructs us to be accountable stewards. As Christ followers, we have to give and we will be giving an account of our lives to him. And in Romans 14, 12, it says, so then each of us will give an account of himself to God. And I'm so thankful that as a reborn Christian, coming to know Christ as my saviour, I don't have to give an account of all my past sins. They have been forgiven. So I'm not going to be judged for my sins because that would consign me to hell. I have received forgiveness and grace through the death of Christ. I've believed upon him. I've received him as my saviour. The old has passed away. The new has come. I live in forgiveness and grace. And I think that is a, an amazing uh, thing that you can never take for granted. That when we have to give an account to God, it's not as sinners who have not received the gift of forgiveness but we will be judged as saints those of us who are Christ followers in other words those who are reborn Christians with what we've done he's going to assess us on what we've done with the free grace that has been lavished upon us the salvation that we've received for free the grace that's come our way the many gifts that he has blessed us with what have we done with those? How faithful have we been? Have we been really good stewards of God's grace and gifts and resources? Uh, Hebrews 4.13 says, Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. And so I'm glad I'm going to give an account of my life as somebody who's been washed clean from the old. And so now this new life is I've got to give an account of what I do with the gifts that he has given to me. And that's going to be our judgment. And the scripture teaches that very clearly. So folks, it says, everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him with whom we must give an account. We are on show. S-H-O-W. Nothing is hidden before our God who sees everything. We're all going to give a personal account of ourselves to God. So if we are on show, then please, firstly, share your gifts. In 1 Peter, he says, each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others. God says, the bounty and the blessings of this life, the ultimate is to use that 
not for self-centered purposes outside of meeting your needs, but to bless other people. And I know folks who are really wealthy. And my wife and I, uh, several, and this, this one person is extremely wealthy, but they're forever crying poverty. They're forever crying poverty. And sometimes I feel like screaming at them and saying, don't you realize what you have? <laughs> You have so much compared to other people. But there, and, I, and Kath and I, we're talking, saying, you know why? It's because they don't know Jesus. And they've got to have something to live for. So what they live for is what they can see and what they feel and what they achieve and what they can accumulate. So I'm not harsh on them. I just think they need Jesus. God, give me opportunity to, to that hole within their heart that's filled with materialism that it be filled with Jesus and then they get a perspective regarding God's ownership and, and why it's important. As Peter says, each one of us should use whatever gift he has received to serve others. So whether it's your house, the gift of a house, a home, use it for hospitality and lodging. And we have a beautiful place and I enjoy our house. But you know, we've got a, an area at the, end, at the end that we call the resort. There's a nice room, there's a swimming pool, and we've geared it so I can banish Catty there when she misbehaves. <laughs> no, it's for guests, for people. My kids, my grandkids, guests, we've got a couple of people from Scotland coming over. They're flying in tomorrow, just people that, that we got to know. We said, come into our place, stay there for as long as you like until you can find, probably be a few days until they can find a place as they're settling and emigrating. And um, use your house. It's a gift. In a hundred years, it's not going to be around anyway. Decomposition sets in. Most things just rust away. Most things fall down. And so while you've got it, it's a material thing, use it. Your car, use it for God. Picking people up for church. Lend it to people. Pray they don't wreck it. <laughs> I did that once and it came back beaten up. And I said, what'd you do with it? He goes, nothing. I said, but I thought, be wise who you lend your car to. The gift of clothing. I mean, this happened yesterday. I get up in the middle of the night, well, five or six in the morning, I get up and, and I'm walking to my study and I nearly trip over and bang my head. I thought, what the heck has Kathy done? And I opened the light and saw these clothes there. I'm thinking, now my beautiful little lounge and office has become a dumping ground. So I was a bit miffed. And then she tells me, oh, um, Maren Spencer and I, you know, Maren's got these clothes and we're actually sorting them out to give to the poor. So I had to repent straight away, you know, I thought, well, okay, that's, I had a bad, they got a good attitude. Always thinking of other people, certainly my wife does, always thinking of, of people in need. The gifts of food, for new mums when they've had their babies, for people who are sick. The gifts of practical skills for people who need help or to just to to give, give to people, to be generous, even to a fault. And uh, uh, Kath and I were crossing Henley Beach Road to go to a coffee lounge down at Torrensville, and um, we saw this guy with one of these shopping trolleys full of toys. He looked like he needed, he hadn't had a bath for about six months. He was behaving really weirdly, and he sort of, things are falling off, so, so I just saw him, I thought, this guy needs some food, he's as skinny as a rake, so I just pulled out 20 bucks and and um, I said, here, I said, take this. I said, go and get yourself some food. And he looks at me and he goes, have you got $5 so I can get something to eat? And I said, man, I just gave you 20 bucks. And I realized he was mentally ill. He was not with it. He was in Dada land. And he drops something and, and it goes on the road. He runs in the middle of the road and goes stop, like stopping the cars and kind of doing all these strange things. Cars are screeching. I'm going, oh, no, we're going to have to take him to the hospital now. And, and so he come. And I thought, people in need. Now, you might say that might be foolish. I may have lost that 20 bucks. He may lose it. He may drink it. He may, I don't know, give it away. And you might say, well, kind of, isn't that wasteful? Look, I'm not worrying about that. I'm giving to Jesus, not to people, and the Lord can deal with them. My response is, I want to share my gifts. I don't mean be irresponsible. Don't be, you know, be wise, but uh, share what has been given to you. This is, life is short on this planet. What's been given to you is a gift. 
And so share your gifts. If you're on show, then please share your gifts. If we're on show, then be honest with your gifts. Paul says now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. Prove yourself faithful. In the early chapters of the book of Acts, um, when you read the, the, the story of the first church, there's a couple of names that stand out. One is Barnabas and one is Ananias and Sapphira, a married couple. Barnabas and Ananias and Sapphira are two <laughs> object lessons of the blessings of being generous and the, bless, and, and the curses of being stingy and also lying and deceiving about your giving. And I mean, it's really scary. It's not the most edifying chapter to read, Acts chapter 4. But, uh, uh, you know, Barnabas was a fantastic example, a, t- a truly honest steward. He sells some property. He says to the church, look, I know you've got a whole pile of needs. And uh, there were people that were getting saved and, and they were being ostracized from their families. There were the Hellenistic Jews that were converted, thousands of them. There was an economic mess in Jerusalem. And so people just help. And he says, look, I've got some now. I'm going to sell it and give it all to you. And Nice and Sapphira, they had some property too, but they lied. So we're going to actually give you everything, you know. So they, they stood out before people. And then they held back and lied and deceived. And they ended up dying prematurely because they were lying to God. And Peter says, why are you lying to God? Why are you giving in to the devil's deceit on this? Be honest with your gifts. Be honest with God. Share your gifts. Be honest with your gifts. And... Um, Christ followers are to be truth tellers and to be honest and open with God and with one another. And they are also to be, they are to properly oversee their gifts. Share them, okay? And uh, be honest with them. Oversee your gifts. Paul says to Timothy, Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to your care. Look after the gifts God has given to you. In Matthew 25 is a great story of the parable of the talents. Remember the parable of the talents where Jesus gives one guy five talents, another guy two or three, another one one, and he comes back, or he gives a parable of of an owner who'd lent the money, and the guys with five and two used it and created more wealth to be able to be more generous. The other guy held it back. He was stingy and wicked and lazy and full of excuses. And Jesus tells him off. And basically, God will give us more gifts. In fact, what was given to him was given to the guy who had five and two, so that they could actually create more wealth because they oversaw the gifts that God had given to them. So God will give us more gifts and talents if we're faithful and honest in what we presently have. And so John Wesley said it so well. He goes, look, earn as much as you can. The founder of the Methodist Church, earn as much as you can, work hard, thrift. Then he goes, save as much as you can. And thirdly, give as much as you can. I think it's a great balance. Work hard, save, earn, save and give. Keep that balance right. So Christ followers, uh, how we show our stewardship is we share our gifts, we're honest with our gifts, we oversee and look after our gifts and finally, we worship God with our gifts. Our whole life is designed to bring praise and honour to God. In 1 Corinthians 6.20, I love this little verse, it says, you were bought at a price, Paul says, so therefore, honour God with your bodies. What was the price? Paul said, God now owns you, he bought you. What was the price paid? He sent Jesus, the eternal son, he becomes Jesus of Nazareth, he dies on a cross to deal with the barrier that separated us from God. So we now have the gift of eternal life and forgiveness. Heaven's our home, not hell our destination. All that's because Christ's blood was shed. You were bought with a price. It costs God. It costs God the life of, of his precious son to, to save us. And he says, therefore, because you were bought with a price, therefore honour God with your bodies. We are to live a life of worship. And worship involves every dimension of our being. Romans 12, 1 says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Abraham in the Old Testament is another example. King David's a great example of, of a heart for God's house. 
Abraham's a great example of, of somebody who's just so full of gratitude that he just wants to give to God. And he worships God by tithing. The very first time that tithing, giving 10% of one's income, is mentioned in the Bible, is by Abraham. And he starts giving to a guy called Melchizedek, king of Salem. And he's just conducted a war, and he's rescued miserable Lot, his nephew, who was living in Sodom. He gets captured, kidnapped, and who knows what was going to happen to Lot and his family. Abraham, with 318 trained men, go and rescue him and bring him back. And you would think after he has given so much that now it's time to relax and time for people to wait upon him. You know what he does? He increases his giving as an act of gratitude to God for giving him the strength and power to be able to rescue his unworthy nephew Lot. He, he just gives and he gives 10% of his income to this king of Salem, king of righteousness, king of peace, named Melchizedek. And uh, see, tithing is an integral aspect of our private and public worship of Jesus. Abraham gives way before the law came. And so this is, he didn't have to. When the law came with Moses, it was actually legislated, instituted, that tithing and giving had to occur. It was compulsory. It's a bit like taxation by our, 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 the state. Actually, there's laws and, and it compels you to have to give a certain amount uh, to the functioning of the state and the betterment of society. So when the law came with Moses, so it was for the nation of Israel. But before then, it was the law of love, the law of gratitude, the law of thankfulness, the law of, saying, the law of worship, saying, God, you're so good, I just want to give to you. And so uh, Abraham is a great example, like David. In the New Testament, you can read about this in 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9, two whole chapters, plus Philippians chapter 4, three whole chapters about the Macedonian Christians, the Corinthian Christians, and those in northern and, 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 and central Greece who started giving over and above their weekly tithes and missions giving to raise money for the poor because there was a massive famine taking place in Judea. And so Paul is really upfront about the need to give. And, uh, and we, tr we have tried over the years to be really upfront with you as a church on the needs of the Christian Family Centre. And uh, for example, when Jeremy and Sandra Steele came and uh, we, we raised their support and, and the good news is, for those of you that have been giving towards them, we've actually reached beyond the target figure. So they have a little bit extra to set up their office in Cairns and to look at getting a vehicle so they can get around. And I'm just so, so thankful for that, that need, because Jeremy's going to bless the nations as he is assisting Pastor Barry Silverback as our denomination's international missions director. And so uh, uh, we're up front and share with you. Let me share with you candidly about the Christian Family Centre's needs right now in 2016. And uh, last year, 2015, our average weekly ties were about $11,600 and our budget for 2016, we need to see that increase by 11%. Which is not a massive amount because the potential within our congregation is, is for far more than that. But we want to see that 11,600 jump up to about 13,000 per week. So we've set a budget to say we're believing for this kind of increase to take place. And I want to encourage you to pray, to believe and to give to realise this target. Particularly if you're not a regular tither, that you'll commence that. Last Sunday, uh, when I shared about uh, building bigger people and our leadership reorganisation um, and introduced the people, I didn't tell you that the CFC paid staff, those that are employed, I think there's 17 people that are employed one day a week through to, to two day, three day, full time, plus our daughter churches, Murray Bridge, Blackwood, Alice Springs, most of our churches, that uh, the staff are actually are on unreasonably low salaries. I can say that because when people ask us and when they find out from other denominations and even our own CRC, they say, Bill, that's what you're on? Wow, you got, this is the largest church and you are... And, and, and I say, no, no, I'm fine. I just suffer for Jesus and, and send my wife out to work. She earns twice as much as me. That's the Greek way. So we, we don't get paid and let her do the work. And... So I've never really taken it. Look, it does not impact me personally. However, all my kids are growing up. My debts are paid off. I'm in a different phase of life to younger pastors and leaders who are producing their kids 
and, and, uh, you know, and it's much tougher these days to even purchase a property than it was back in the 70s and 80s when we first started. Look, I say this to you because right across the board, our CFC salaries team, we have a salaries committee, a remuneration tribunal, you can say, that are authorised, and, and these, these guys, there's uh, actually uh, five of them, I'll put their names up there so you know, appear. So three from this church, Pete Crouch, Dave Hersey, Dave Wabnitz, who are elders, on the board of elders of all our Christian Family Centre churches, Raymond Long, who's on the leadership team of Murray Bridge, and Wayne Buckerfield, who's on the leadership team of Blackwood. Now, these men are authorised by the board of elders to handle all remuneration matters. And so, uh, for example, uh, I have never, and our staff have never been involved in making decisions about their own remuneration package. And for 38, 40 years... So that area is outside of our direction. So we have people who are non-salaried leaders who make those decisions. And so they have said they want to address the low salaries right across the Christian Family Centre. So when I'm travelling, um, like when I went to Alice Springs, I addressed it with the church there. And when I'm going to Murray Bridge, I'm going to address it there because to say to the people, hey, listen, our salaries team want to address this to try and align our paid staff salaries just with the guidelines that our CRC denominational family have said is fair and reasonable, so we're, we're way below that. And, um, and so I want to encourage you, in fact, the guys who are here, the salaries team, where are you guys? Peter Crouch, stand please. Dave Hersey and, where, and Pete, uh, Dave Wabnitz, David Hersey. Peter, Peter Crouch is the chairman of this group and he oversees it, Dave Hersey and Dave Wabnitz. I'll, I'll get them to stand because you may not know them, long-term elders of the church but if you wanted to ask them any questions about the salaries of the Christian Family Centre don't come to me or Tim or Cass or Milan go to them they are the authority in these matters and so in presenting this to you is I want to encourage you to say if you haven't commenced tithing let's see that 11% increase take place from 11.6 to 13 to cover the budget and to see that the guys are free to be able to look at all the salaries and say, and I've said to them, guys, count me out. I don't need, I don't need any, anything more. And whether they listen to that or not, that's their business. But it's really for those that are younger and newer that we want to take care of them. But they're the guys. So if you want to ask them any questions, they're available after the service or even during the week and they can ask you, don't have to ask me those questions. Good on you guys. Put your hands together for our salaries team, hey? Can we stand together? In all our years as a church, none of our paid staff across our churches, and in fact, even with this initiative, they have not asked for this. They've never asked for a salary increase. They're humble and faithful servants. I'll just present it to you. This is a need, and we need to address it, and, and the salaries guys want to address it. And I want to challenge you deeply today about taking action all of us, when we take action on this matter of God's ownership and our stewardship, it tests our beliefs and it kind of ensures that we're living out our beliefs. <laughs> and if you are a faithful financial supporter of the church, and I look around, I think so many of you are, you give your weekly tithes, you give to monthly missions, you support our facilities projects, some of you have been doing it for 30 plus years, I commend you and thank you for that. You are champions in the life of the church. We could not function unless you were accountable, faithful stewards of, um, uh, of Jesus Christ and your, your missions giving and facilities giving. So I commend you if you are a f one of those who has been, you've dealt with this and, and maybe what I've shared today, just remind you, God, you're the owner. Help me to be an accountable steward. It's a privilege and a joy to align my life to your word as a Christ follower. If you have not reached that point, I want to encourage you and for you to develop a heart for Jesus' house and to commence tithing as a starting point, just to commence. And uh, this is his house and there are needs that we have. We also have missions needs as we give to the poor and the needy of other countries and we want to keep increasing that. In May, we'll talk about our facilities needs and some of the things that need to take place. 
and that, that's another area in our yearly uh, facility stewardship focus. But I want to encourage you to uh, commence tithing. If you need to understand it more, I, I try and produce little booklets like this one on Christian stewardship, I've got one on baptism in the Holy Spirit, um, commitment to Christ. For me, I need to make sure that my practices are aligned to my beliefs and that my beliefs have got to be based on Scripture. That these are not my beliefs or our beliefs, but the beliefs that are, that are rooted and grounded in the Scriptures. And so I've tried to put all the Old and New Testament Scriptures there. You can study them and reflect on them because to me, this area of giving, like baptism in the Holy Spirit and the gift of speaking in other tongues, a lot of people don't understand it. Once they start reading the Scripture and start meditating, I think, oh, okay, that's a gift. And then as they read and reflect, faith rises for them to be able to say, Lord, I would like that gift as well. So the principle of tithing and giving, as you align your thinking and beliefs to God's Word, and then you, you say, God, I need your grace to be able to make it work, uh, you, you know what blessing comes back on your life? Uh, God's no man's debtor, and it's much more blessed to give than to receive. So grab that booklet, it's in the entranceway, we've got a whole stack of them there. I want to lead you in a prayer. Can we just close our eyes?